Hello, everybody, and welcome again once um, again back to my and your business. And tonight we are talking with Sue Arrington, our state representative. Sue has served on the Delaware County Council and the Indiana State um, Board, and she is a Hoosier who continues to give back to Muncie communities. And she came here in Indiana, to Indiana in 1970 to go to Boston. State, and she's been here ever since. Her love for Indiana has given her a vision that she knows where these kids are, and the kids get a world class education. This, this is what she stands for. She wants to make sure that they're prepared well for jobs and affordable health care, and she wants to make sure that it's available to everyone. And so she's here to take action to improve the quality of our environment. So tonight, while we have Sue. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to put them in the comment box and we will try to get those answered for you. Um, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me to your, your live stream. Have we lost the sound? <laughs> I'm not there. Hold on a second. There we go. You okay. got me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. I'm sorry. When I brought when I brought the picture down, it took me away. <laughs> but oh. I was gonna say, when I got this platform, I was like, you know, I don't even know where to begin. And then I just started reaching out to people to, you know, say, hey, this is a platform for those to come on and be able to talk about their views or their issues, their beliefs and what they stand for. And then it dawned on me, you know, it's election time. Let's see who we can get on here that can come and help us to understand voting and the importance of it and, and what matters most and why we should vote. And so I'm glad that I knew you, first of all, because it was easy for me to reach out to you. And you are always so sweet and you always support things that I reach out to you for. So welcome, Sue, and thank you for being here tonight. Oh, I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to come on with you tonight. Yeah. yeah. So, so today you said you've been out knocking on doors. What's your days look like? Uh, well, today I... I'm on the uh, Indiana uh, Recycling Market Development Board, and we had a Zoom meeting to uh, decide which companies uh, to give grants to. And so that was the morning. Um, I, I knocked on doors uh, this afternoon, and I had an interview uh, for a possible endorsement. Uh, that was from Planned Parenthood. So, and then I went out and knocked on some more doors <laughs> and now I'm here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So give us a little insight on why you got into politics. What, what um, drove you to become a politician? Okay. Well, it's sort of a long story. It's sort of an evolution. I started as someone who was very passionate about certain issues. And so I was an activist and I would go to marches. I went to the state house and lobbied my legislators. And uh, then I went to this rally and the state senator who was speaking told us sometimes it's easier to change legislators than it is to change a legislator's vote. Mm -hmm. And that really struck me. So at that point, I started looking for candidates that I could support and help in their campaigns. So I did that for quite a long time. Um, there, but there, I guess it was uh, 1992, which um, Delaware County was building our current justice center. I don't, you probably are mm -hmm. too young to remember mm -hmm. what a controversial <laughs> thing it was. <laughs> no, I remember. I, I was about to graduate around that time. <laughs> okay. Well, it was way behind schedule and way over budget. And it was coming up on an election. And it the county council 
uh, and one one year they elect we elect the uh, at large candidates, and four years later we elect the ones that are in districts. Well, this was the year 1992 that we were going to elect the at large candidates, and there are three of them, and all three decided not to run. I think they saw the handwriting on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> and so I thought, oh, that's a wonderful opportunity. There are no women at this point on the county council. We need to get one. So I started going around to women that I knew that I thought would make a good county council member and asked them to run. Every one of them turned me down. But the last one, when she turned me down, she said, Sue, why don't you run? And, you know, I thought, it was almost time for filing deadline. I, maybe I should. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I did. Uh, I, you know, checked with my husband, see what he thought about it. He said, go for it. Uh, I checked with my friends. They said, go for it. With those friends, I had another question for them. And that was, will you help me? And they all said yes. And so I ran and I was successful. Uh, so that was my start, but I always had an interest in state issues. And so um, when Senator Craycraft, Allie Craycraft decided to um, retire, he'd been in for a long time, 20, over 20 years. Uh, I thought, okay, I've got a little money in the bank. <laughs> I'm going to, talked to my husband, talked to my friends. They all said, go for it. And I did. So I became, I was elected to the state Senate and that was a four year term in 2006. Um, I ran for reelection in 2010, but that was not a good year for Democrats and it wasn't a good year for me. I lost. But two years later, the opening at the, in the House of Representatives for this district came up I ran again and I won. That was 2012 and um, representatives run every two years. So I've been running since 2012 and this is another election year. So I'm out there knocking on doors. <laughs> I think I, I met you I around 2012. 2012. Uh -huh. um, we were at the Dollisons and um, there was some things going on and they had a get together and you were there and that was the first encounter I had with you. And I really, we had a conversation and I really liked the points that you brought up and the things that you stood for. And ever since that day in 2012 to now, you seem to be that same person. Huh? Um, what is it when we are looking at candidates that we need to, cause I know a lot of times, say with our current president right now <laughs> a lot of times people look at the person and not the policy so what is it as voters should we be aware of and should we be looking at when we are choosing a candidate or when we're standing behind someone okay well you know one thing is are there stands similar to mine uh, is this person likely to be, um, you know, when they vote, representing what I believe in? So it's important for people to get to know where the candidates stand. Uh, we just had a, a virtual candidate forum a couple nights ago uh, for state representative. And unfortunately, the Republicans didn't show up. They didn't come. Uh, in fact, I guess they didn't even, some of them at least, didn't even return the phone calls when they were invited. So I think you want to look at, are these people that want to represent me, are they accessible? Are they open? Are they, you know, they're, I want them to be accountable. Mm -hmm. And so I think those are the kinds of things that when I'm looking at candidates, and trying to decide who am I going to support, those are things that I look at. And as a candidate, I mean, I feel like those are my guiding principles, openness, accountability, and accessibility. That's what I want in a candidate, and that's what I try to be. 
Yeah, I think sometimes people look at politicians um, as larger than life, unreachable. And so how reachable or attainable should it be to talk to your state representative or to reach out to some a congressman or to reach out to someone that is supposed to be representing you? How easy is it to contact those offices? Well, it's a lot easier for people to contact and, you know, have a conversation with those that are in offices that are closer to home, mm -hmm. like our local county commissioners, uh, council, uh, and then the state is too. I mean, I live in Muncie, even though we make our laws in Indianapolis. So, you know, I'm always running into a constituent at the grocery store. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to chat with them. And often, you know, I figure, well, it's probably going to take me 15 minutes longer <laughs> on this shopping trip than it ordinarily would. And sometimes it's more than that. But that's okay because I do want to know what people think. Um, we here in the at the state we have an offices at the state house in Indianapolis. So, but we don't, at least I don't have one in Muncie. My office is my home and my phone and my computer. Um, so I try to be very accessible, make sure that people know what my, you know, how to get in touch with me. Um, in Indianapolis, um, as I say, we, the legislators aren't there on a regular basis, uh, except when we're making laws. That's between January and the end of April next year. Uh, but we do have some staff. Um, for example, I have what's called a legislative assistant that I share with two other legislators. So she splits her time three ways. And she's in Indianapolis, uh, ordinarily at the state house, but with COVID, they're working from remotely too a lot of the time. But she's there. Uh, if people uh, go to my legislative website, uh, she answers the phone. She uh, sends me the emails that I get so that I can respond to them, whether it's calling somebody back or emailing them back. Okay. And how often do you, how, how much, mail or emails or text messages how often are people reaching out to you how much do you have people coming to you it really depends on what's going on so if we're in the legislative <clears throat> session and there's a really controversial bill i start getting a lot of of emails calls People don't write letters as much as they used to. Okay. Uh, it's mostly email. And so I get a lot of those. Uh, like in the last session, uh, we heard from, uh, from teachers a lot because we were trying to get their teacher pay raised. So we would hear from them. They had a rally. Uh, they called it uh, Red for Ed Day. And you know, mm -hmm. like 15,000 teachers showed up mm -hmm. at the legislature. That's really unusual for teachers. They're usually you know, back home, getting their lessons together, teaching their classes, and don't really uh, have that much time to um, head down to the state house. But this was one time when, you know, it's sort of like their backs were up against the wall. Uh, and so they decided to come down and uh, they had the rally. I um, was one of the speakers at their rally. I was really happy to see them all and especially the ones from Muncie. Because <laughs> my district uh, is only Muncie. I don't have anything outside of the city limits. So it's a nice compact district. It's easy to get around in and to, uh, to, to see and to be with the people I represent. Okay. How does the districts work exactly? Well, they are designed by uh, the legislature. And so they, they, every year or every 10 years, redistricting, we, the maps are redrawn. 
and it happens the year after the census. So this year's the census, the maps will be redrawn next year. And a main reason for that is, you know, people move all the time and the districts need to be pretty much this, the same number of people in each one. So in 10 years, they can get out of balance. So they that's the reason for redrawing them. Now, you may have heard of the term gerrymander. Mm -hmm. And that's because, uh, well, it, years ago, there was a New York legislator by the name of Jerry. <laughs> and he drew the maps there and he made them look like lizards <laughs> snake <laughs> and so ever since when you get a weird looking district you know it's been gerrymandered well thank you there's probably a lot of people that have been wanting to know what exactly that means so thank you for clearing that up yeah. one other thing you mentioned you mentioned the census can you explain to people the importance of the census and why um they should take the time to fill that out and send it back in Yes, I'm glad you brought that up because it is really important that everybody be counted because that count determines uh, funding that comes back into uh, the, the county and the city, uh, the count and the demographics of who lives here is very useful for um, when somebody's putting together a grant, you know, like they want to submit it uh, for social services. And that data, it's important that they capture everything. So a lot of time, there are some people who think, well, it doesn't really matter, but it does. Mm -hmm. uh, that, and this year, because of COVID, it's been much more difficult for the census takers to get out. They got a late start. And unfortunately, President Trump has moved up the deadline for completing it to the end of this month. It was supposed to be the end of next month. So that I've, as I've been going door to door, I've run into census takers too, who are out there doing their job. Uh, a lot of people responded right away when they first found out about it, got their, you know, their their letter or their card mm -hmm. and filled it out online. It takes maybe five mm -hmm. minutes and other people then have done it by phone, but those that are harder to reach, they're the ones that the census takers are going out and knocking on their doors. So they have a way of identifying who hasn't filled out the census, the census and who's not turned it in and they are able to reach those people. Now, is there a law or anything against not filling it out? Or is it? Actually? No, it's not. There's no law. But, um, and some people say um, Latinx are concerned that they or someone will be turned in if they know somebody that is not here, you know, legally. Mm -hmm. But that's not the case. Uh, it's complete privacy. Nobody's going to come after anybody, whether they're, you know, a citizen or not a citizen. Okay, I'm sorry. So let me get that cleared up then. If someone is not documented legally, they still need to fill out the census, but there's not going to be repercussions for them doing so is what you're saying? Yes, that's right. You have complete privacy in with the census. They don't report you to anybody okay. uh, because you know they're part of the population and the census goal is to count everybody. Okay, all right. Well, there you go. I mean, it just clearing this up because a lot of times people are unsure, they don't know. We've been taught certain things our whole life vote Democrat or vote Republican. It's usually how you've been raised is how you vote or, you know, what you've been used to is how you vote. But I want you to talk about the importance, like you talked about the candidates that you vote for. But as far as the issues and the views, why is it important and why does every vote count? Well, it's important because sometimes the vote 
is very narrow where you know by one vote or just a few votes so uh i i know people often think well my vote won't matter mm -hmm. but it does because your voice matters and if you don't vote somebody else's vote will count double because they, their voice has taken the place of of yours yeah uh and so some people think uh I know as I've not right now, it's, we can still register people to vote. The deadline is uh, October 5th, if you wanna vote in this upcoming election. But I've run into quite a number of people who, when I ask them, are you registered to vote? They'll say, no, I'm a felon. But that it doesn't matter as long as you are not behind bars you can vote so what why did they get that idea that they can't vote well when they go into prison they're told that their voting rights are taken away from them but when they come out they're not told if you re-register you can vote again so that's a message that i think we need to get out uh to, to, to everybody so that they don't just give up and think they can't vote because in Indiana, they can. Some states, uh, you can't, but in Indiana, you can. Okay, that's good to know. And I know um, one time when I was actually out registering people to vote and talking to them about it, I ran into that situation and it was a lot of people that did not know that. And I'm like, no, you know, and I think a lot of it is that we're not educated enough to understand what our rights are and where we, don't know. And so you don't know what you don't know. And so that's why I'm glad you are on here so we can ask these questions because, <clears throat> you know, there's some things that's been pressing me lately as far as the news and the protesting and Black Lives Matter. And if it's okay, I just want to ask you a few questions because it, it's some laws that need to be changed and it's some things that need to be done, especially for minorities and for Black people in general. Mm -hmm. And what is it that we need to do to get these laws changed? Because this whole Breonna Taylor thing that's going oh. on, it, it's, it's crazy. And, you know, I just I don't even know how to wrap my head around it, because when I look at certain things and I look at the Constitution, even that says the black people aren't even 100 percent human beings. Why is that not brought to the surface why is no one ever spoke about that why is nothing being done to get these things changed because my husband and i were talking and it's like if there's a law that says that it's not wrong then then they're right with what they're doing but that means that law needs to be changed and so what is it that we need to do to come together to change some laws and to actually make black lives matter because marching and protesting is not enough Yes, yes. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg <laughs> uh, told Gloria Steinem when she had organized the big rally, the first women's rights rally, and Gloria said, oh, isn't this turnout wonderful? And RBG said, nothing matters until you have the law in the right place. So um, I look, I think in answer to your question, we haven't, the majority hasn't looked at the minority voice, hasn't listened. And it's unfortunate that it's taken a tragedy for people to begin to say, to wake up and say, we need change. And so I know at the local level, we have a, a group of citizens who have come together to put together a plan for reforms in Muncie, uh, particularly with, you know, law enforcement. And there have been uh, two uh, community forums. And so I think that's great. And so I think we need to keep pushing at that local front. Mm -hmm. At the state level, the, we have the Indiana Legislative Black Caucus. That's the legislators who are um, people of color. And they too have an agenda that they have put together 
which uh, some of it has to do with changes for the administration, but others have to do with things that we could put in place as laws. And I think, uh, you know, things like chokeholds, barring those would be something that, you know, the, a police department could say no more, but you could also have an ordinance or a state law that said, we're not gonna have that in Indiana. Mm -hmm. So one thing, one thing I have to bring up is that for years, Indiana did not have a um, hate crimes law. Finally, a couple of years ago, two years ago, we passed one, but it's not, it's not a complete, it doesn't cover, it's not comprehensive, it doesn't cover everybody. Mm -hmm. And so we, we really need to revisit that and finish the job and make it cover every citizen so that we all have the same civil rights. Yeah, I would agree. And you know, I sometimes, you know, I'm blinded by certain things and I, and you know, and sometimes as people, we feel like, oh, that doesn't affect me or doesn't have anything to do with me or that's on television or that's there, but it, it does, it hits home because, you know, my husband, when I see him in the, in the, in the, looks on his face sometimes when he sees the things that's going on in television with with the shootings and everything and i'm like well that's not happening here but it's crazy for me to think that it's irrelevant because i'm not putting myself in his position and understanding because the other night he was saying you know i'm terrified sometimes to just go to the grocery store to pick up something not knowing what might happen and I go, well, but you're not that type of person. And so this is what he helped me to understand. So I just want to see what your thoughts is on this. Um, he said, it doesn't matter what type of person you are. It doesn't matter if you've committed a crime or not. That's what they have the judicial system for. You should be able to have your day in court. No one should lose their life because they committed a crime or because the color of their skin or because someone was scared of them because of the color of their skin. And so that's the thing as my, my husband as a black man has to deal with. And you know, and when I stopped and I thought about that for a second, I'm just like, wow. And not only that, with him being a man, the whole Breonna Taylor thing, it doesn't have anything to do with man or woman now. It's just, it's this thing of people being scared of black people. And and Sue, I'm just gonna be honest with you, I never encountered that. And I'm not saying that it doesn't exist because I know that it does exist. But there are other people because they've never been faced with it, they don't understand the detriment or they don't think that there's a problem and people need to get over it or whatever. And it's like, how much more is gonna have to happen before you realize that people a human being's life matters in general and it needs to stop, you know? And so I'm just saying when, when someone is being pulled over or apprehended or whatever situ the situation is, is it okay if they don't listen or if they don't obey for them to be shot? Is that okay? Oh, absolutely not. So why wouldn't anybody not recognize that it's wrong? I don't know. They're blind, I guess. <laughs> but, you know, I uh, we didn't have a corporate luncheon this year, but I ordinarily attend them. Uh, you know, they're part of uh, of, uh, of what we do in the summer. And I went to one a couple of years ago, and I now I don't remember the name of the judge, but he grew up in Muncie. And they asked him to come back. He's now a federal judge in Washington, D.C. Uh, he told us how he and his family had driven to Chicago for a funeral. And they were headed home. It was, it was nighttime. And they got stopped for no reason other than driving while black. And here he is, a federal judge that gets stopped. And I know at one of these community forums, uh, Watasha Barnes Griffin gave a really passionate uh, plea 
for what it's like to be a black mother of a son mm -hmm. and having the things you have to tell to warn them about and the ways you have to behave that no white mother has to even think about that so there's there's something wrong in our society when we've tilted the scale so much that uh, people of color don't feel safe mm -hmm. and aren't. <laughs> and and you're you're right, and that's that's the funny thing that you know it looks like. Well, I was scared of them, but truthfully, we're the ones that are endangered species, and so you know. I wanted to ask you this because I've been wrestling with this whole voting thing this year. I really, I really have been wrestling with it because when I look at one end, I'm like, yeah. Mm. And when I look at the other end, I'm like, mm, mm, mm. and so I'm like, why? Nobody is standing up, speaking out, saying anything that I want to hear. No, nobody that I want to vote for is running. So do I vote for the lesser of two evils or do I not vote at all? Because people get mad at you if you don't vote but i need to understand what i'm voting for mm -hmm. and and not just me i'm not just saying this because of myself because i know that because people don't say it doesn't mean they don't feel it and you know and somebody has to speak up and ask these tough questions because the elephant is not going away the band-aid's been ripped off now it's just blood everywhere so you know what is it going to take how do we have the right candidates in place. And then they say, well, if you vote, you can vote for the right candidate. Well, I don't want to vote for either one of these candidates to tell you the truth. And so I'm trying to understand wh where's the candidate that is actually representing the voice of the people for sure. That's saying that this is wrong. You can't have this. You This is not right. I mean, at, at the end of the day, when does it become, I'm not just doing my job. I'm doing what is morally and ethically right, you know? And so that's, that's where I'm torn because I don't feel like there's any moral or ethics when it comes to politics half the time. <laughs> well, I hope I'm an exception to that. You are, you are definitely, you but, are. You know, it, it starts with the primary election because that's where both parties, well, all parties, uh, but talking primarily about the Democrats and Republicans, that's where they have candidates that are running against each other to become the candidate for the fall. Mm -hmm. So, if, but a lot of people don't pay any of for the primary. But that's where you could find, uh, if you're doing your research by, you know, meeting the candidates or looking at their website, asking them questions. You can find out where do they, uh, you ask them what's important to you and you ask them where they stand on that. And so that's when you can begin to support somebody who supports what you believe in. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time you get to the general election, you know, they're, the two candidates may be people that neither one, like you say, is a the lesser of two evils. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I guess doing, and it's hard for people when you're just trying to get by in life yeah. <laughs> to make the extra effort to find out what, where the candidates stand on things that you think are important. Mm -hmm. um, but, and that's another thing. It's, it is really important for the candidates to get out there and be where the public is. Be in the public eye, be available for for questions. Uh, I know there's a, um, I don't, maybe you've heard about it, the youth block party tomorrow mm -hmm. uh, that's going to be uh, outside the YMCA from four to six. And they've invited all the candidates to come. So I'm planning to go. And, and it's an opportunity for young people to meet the candidates and sort of look them over and decide who do I think <laughs> uh, I would want to vote for. And it's also an opportunity if you're old enough to register to vote. Okay. And is that at the women's Y or the men's Y? The men's. Okay. I'm going to put that up. Oh. 
Okay. Yeah, and, and it's, it, it's totally student-led and organized. And okay. it, it, kids from schools all over the county, it's a cooperative effort among the, the students. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah, it's a lot of younger people that are getting involved. And I know uh, it's so funny because people are like, those millennials, they're doing that. And I'm like, oh, my God, I love the millennials because they're not afraid. <laughs> they're not afraid to speak out and to say what bothers them. And they look at things and they're like, that's not right. I'm not, you know, and they want to change things. And so a, a lot of times people that have been so used to things being one way, they're like, oh, those millennials, they're, they're going to tear this country up. But no, I actually think they are going to make it better because they do care and they do want to come together and they do want to see this as a better place. Um, so being in politics, how has it affected your life? I mean, as the person that that is a Hoosier and that loves Indiana and, you know, does it does it make you feel more connected or does it make you feel like, you know, sometimes it weighs on you? How, do, how does it affect you? Well, sometimes the decisions we have to make weigh on us. Mm -hmm. But when we see that we've done something that helps the people of Indiana, that really feels good. And we've had some of both. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so and the other thing that legislators do besides making laws, we do a lot of con uh, constituent service. And so, that, so what that is, if you have somebody who's having problems, maybe uh, they're caught in the red tape of the bureaucracy for Medicaid or for uh, you know, unemployment or renter's assistance, uh, usually people are pretty desperate for the, the time they think of, oh, I think I'll contact my state legislature. <laughs> but, you know, we can help with some of these things. Okay. And so uh, with COVID, for example, I have helped hundreds of people get through the problems with their unemployment. And it's not just that DWD doesn't want to help them, but it's just they've been overwhelmed with a number of people oh, yeah. who need help. So I feel really good when I'm able to help somebody like that. All right, great. Can you tell us about one of your biggest wins? Oh, one of my biggest wins? Um, I guess uh, being in the minority party, <laughs> the wins are few and far between. And sometimes it doesn't matter who gets the credit. It's getting something through. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you about one of those. I had a bill to, and it was designed to prevent cervical cancer. And it was to, uh, you know, we have a, um, a vaccination for HPV, which is mm -hmm. the leading cause of cervical cancer. And by the way, has become the leading cause of throat cancer. Uh, so anyway, my bill was uh, to set some standards and some goals for uh, vaccination against HPV. And it's one of it's a vaccination. You know, a lot of vaccinations are for babies, mm -hmm. but this one is for young people, middle school age. Mm -hmm. So I worked with the chair of the House Public. Uh, health committee who is a Republican because they're in the majority and we worked together and we got it through the committee. I mean, it was unanimous. And so there's a couple more steps that things have to go through in one house and it all goes to the other one. So I got it through what's called second reading, which is when uh, legislators, if they are not happy with the bill, they can try to amend it. So it got through that. So it was ready for the last stop <laughs> when <laughs> this bill caught the attention of our governor, who at that time was Mike Pence. He didn't like not like the fact that it had to do with some something having to do with sex, like <laughs> HPV. 
So he got it stopped within the Republican caucus. It failed by, I think, two or three votes. It was really a shock. But a couple of years later, a Republican woman took up the crusade. And her bill, it did the same thing, but it was, you know, written a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. It went through, I think, almost unanimously, if not unanimously, in both houses. So I feel, and I was a, a co-author for it, but I feel like the fact that I raised the issue in the first place is what got it rolling. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it had to be a different name on it <laughs> to get it all the way through, but it got yeah. through. <laughs> and see, that's the thing that I think sometimes that bothers me with that, because it's like, Really, does it matter if it's good and it's a good cause and it's healthy? You're going to shut it down over here, but then you're going to come back and, and it's no different. And I just I don't understand why we make things so hard instead of working together to do what's right. And, and I've even worked in situations where it's like, why is this so hard? I worked in retail for a long time and it was so strange that the stores that did really good, they... Um, they might not be the stores that you would think. And mine was one of them. And this is this situation was the craziest thing. But Muncie, here in Muncie, at the mall here, I ran one of the stores out there and you had to um you had to do a, a certain volume within a year to get a remodel. Mm -hmm. Well, Sue, I did that in 12 months. We did $2.5 million. We had the highest credit card sales. Every last employee that I had could run that store. And I was the store manager and pretty much the first black store manager in the mall. And how I got that position is I was recruited to Indianapolis. And I knew if I go to Indianapolis, <laughs> I'll be able to come back to Muncie and get a higher pay rate and get a management position. And lo and behold, that's what happened. And I was excited. And the manager, the um, district manager that I had, he and I had a really good rapport. Well, they moved him to another district. And when they did that, they brought in another district manager. And when he came in and he saw my store and he saw everything that I was doing against the Carmel stores and the Castleton Square stores, he just couldn't believe that. And so when I gave my girls raises and the guys raises or whatever, when we had reviews, he told me that there was no way that that was possible. And I go, do you not see our numbers? This is our numbers. I mean, the, the proof is in the numbers. It's right no. here. And they did every single thing that they could do to demolish that. And I just, I could not understand it. And at that point, there's nothing you can do about the money that we made because we did 2.5. Well, <laughs> things happened before I got to see that come to fruition. But just so you know, anytime you walk by American Eagle, that's oh, that was because your of store? me. That was, your that was store? because of me. Uh -huh. The reason why they have that remodel in the face of that store is because the numbers that my store did that year. And I was done horribly in that situation. And I couldn't understand it because there was things going on in other stores that weren't right, but there wasn't nothing being done about that. And I'm just like, when you see wrong, why don't you stand up for it? When you see right, why do you sweep it under the rug? And sometimes I think that that's what gives people a bad taste in their mouth when it comes to voting and when it comes to seeing, because it, it seems like one way, oh, I'm so for you and you're going to do the right thing. And then it's like they get in the place and then what happened? And so is it because when it comes to voting, it has to be a majority. So we know that. But is it that when it comes to it, you have to do what everybody else does and or you really aren't doing what you were supposed to do in the first place? I mean, if that makes any sense, what I just tried to say to you. Yeah. No, I, I think you're right. There is a lot of pressure to go along to get along, mm -hmm. uh, particularly within, uh, you know, in the same party. Although I have to say my caucus, that's what we call it in the in the legislature. There we we get together, we talk about a bill and we're pretty much decide uh, everybody looks at their district and thinks, what would my constituents want me to do? So that's, we don't all vote together. Okay. Um, 
because we're all Democrats and our values are similar, we vote, you know, pretty much as a, a group on a lot of things, but not everything. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I, I, when I was a freshman legislator, I went to this national conference of women legislators and we had this um, panel of the veteran legislators for us newbies. And somebody asked, uh, what do you do if your personal values are in conflict with what your you think your constituents mm -hmm. want? And so what the advice we were given was whenever you can vote your constituency, but if there is something that you morally believe, ethically believe should be different, then you have to live with yourself. So vote your, your morals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I, I, try to keep that, I try to keep that in mind. Yeah, I believe that about you. So I'll ask you a few more questions. Um, you brought up the vaccine for the HPV. And so now we know with COVID and everything that's going on that they're talking about a vaccine. A vaccine is going to be out pretty soon. What, are you, what do you see about that? Where do you think that's going? Or, and how should we embrace that if it does come to, back, to be? Well, I want to make sure it's gone through all the clinical trials <laughs> and it's safe. Uh, and I think that is the concern for a lot of people is, are they rushing it and will they get something out that we, after you get the shot, you find out it's not safe. Yeah. But, you know, if they do the proper, you know, the safeguards, then I think, I mean, I'll get the shot. Uh, I can. I was a child when we had the polio epidemic, and it mostly hit children. Mm -hmm. And I saw, you know, a, a girl in my uh, in my school who was in an iron lung. She couldn't breathe on her own. And back then, I guess they didn't have respirators. They had these iron lungs. <laughs> and I know it was every parent's nightmare that their child would get this well we came up with a vaccine and everybody got it uh there were there wasn't a, really a controversy people thought this will save my child's life or keep them from becoming paralyzed and so we've gotten away from that and i know there's a group of people who uh, we you know, are anti-vaxxers. They say, I'll never get a vaccine. I won't let my child get a vaccine. But uh, I, I hope that people with COVID will think beyond that. And if it's safe, um, we'll, we'll recover as a country much faster mm -hmm. if we can get that herd immunity and vaccine vaccinations are a big part of that. Yeah. It, well, I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to ask you that next. As far as COVID, what is the worst thing that you've seen? And I mean, you you made it through the polio and, you know, that era. So what what have you seen that you've had to face that has been worse than COVID or is COVID the worst thing that you've seen so far? Well, COVID's pretty bad. <laughs> um, you know, it hasn't hit me personally. But when I see the news about people dying in uh, nursing homes, that is so tragic. Uh, people who are frail and vulnerable, and it just seems to go right through like wildfire. Mm -hmm. uh, we're doing better with it now. Uh, we've they figured out how to you know, contain it. Uh, but it's still, I, I mean, you think uh, going to a nursing home is to keep somebody safe. They'll yeah. be safer there than at home. Well, <laughs> we've seen with COVID that isn't always the case. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so and I remember there was an article in the paper. Um, I think he was the Blackford athletic director. 
Blackford County athletic director who ended up in the hospital and he's still there. He's been there for uh, several months. But one thing that he said really hit me was when he was there fairly early on, he noticed this camera in the room and he said, what's that for? And he was told, well, that's where the family watches their loved one die. Oh. <laughs> that was so awful. Oh my goodness. Because to think of your, you know, your loved one alone in the hospital, yeah. you can't be with them and they're dying. Yeah. Like that is really tragic. Yeah. I've got a friend that is going through surgery. She had breast cancer. And so she's going to go through surgery tonight and she should maybe be home tomorrow. And I'm glad her journey's almost over and she, she's made it through. But she's had to go through this whole situation alone. Her husband can't go to any doctor appointments with her. You yeah. know, she's had to do this by herself. And I told her, I always told her, I'm like, you're a very strong woman. You're very brave. But I couldn't imagine because last October, right before, you know, the year came by, my husband had open heart surgery. Oh. We didn't even know that he was sick. And he went to the hospital because he wasn't feeling well. And the next thing you know, they're saying he's got a 1% chance to live and flying him to Indianapolis. And wow. so, oh. I, yeah, it, it was so crazy, but he, he got through it. But now when COVID comes and they say the people that it can affect, now it can affect my friend that's got breast cancer. It can affect my husband who had open heart surgery. And so it's like, you've got to take all these precautions because, you know, you don't know what could happen. And so we kept, we made a conscious decision to keep our children home because we've got five of them and they, we've got four that go to three different schools. And if one of them gets sick and all of them have to come home or if something, you know, and so I talked to the principal and I just told him, I said, we're not trying to, you know, be funny or anything, but there's too many people in our household to, <laughs> you know, it, it just is. And so to be on the safe side, I believe it's better to keep them home. And luckily, they, they're they all pretty smart kids. <laughs> Thank God for that. <laughs> oh God, that. That's a blessing. But, you know, they, they get up every morning like they're going to school. They have a routine. And even our kindergartner, she's on board now. She wasn't before. School wasn't her thing. But now that she gets to do it at home. But I just feel like it's safer that way because I don't want to put – my husband at risk. And I think that out of everybody in our household, he and my mom lives with us too. But between the two of them, I think he's more at risk than anybody else. And so I just, you know, I, I feel like whatever we need to do to make sure that our loved ones are safe and other people are safe, you know, I don't really care for masks. I think it's dumb, but I don't do it for me. I can't breathe, you know, no. <laughs> I'm like this, but I, I don't do it for me. I do it because it's the right thing to do. And so I just, I applaud you for standing up for the people, for going out, for speaking the truth and talking about the issues that, that are hard to talk about. And I thank you for giving me a chance to ask those questions because I do look at you as a friend and I, I don't want to ever come across like I'm being negative or anything like that. I just want to know. And sometimes when we have questions that we want to know, we don't ask because we're afraid of the backlash or whatever. But I believe that you are honest and that you will tell the truth. And so I applaud you for allowing me to ask you these tough questions because they, they've been in my mind. And I'm just like, I don't want to have questions in my head that are unanswered <laughs> and just, you know, and, and, and be wrong. I don't want to assume anything you know? And so I want to know what the truth is. So when I do go to the polls, I can make an informed decision. I can be conscious about what I'm doing and have an understanding. And I want other people to understand how important it is because our lives depend on it. You yeah. Know? So what happens in, you know, Congress and the state house and in the county building and in city hall, all of that affects our lives. Yes. Yes. Our lives, everyone. Yes. So my last question okay. that I have for you this evening, <laughs> Miss State Representative. Yes. When are you going to put your, your bid in for presidency? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm happy where I'm at because I, I'm closer to people. 
Okay, but see, that's the thing. We need people that are going to do the right thing on a higher level. <laughs> Remember when you came state representative? It's because nobody else would do it. <laughs> well, <laughs> right. well, you know, I'm I think Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will be good for our country. So I'm I'm rooting for them to All right. To win. All right. All right. So that's who, that's who you're backing and supporting. And so you you stated your claim. That's what we we heard tonight, and I and I just thank you for your honesty and your truth. And um, let everyone know how they can volunteer for you, or how they can get out and help people get registered before October fifth. What what do they need to do to get involved? Well, th I love to have people involved with my campaign, and so um, I have a website. If, let me put this up here. <laughs> See my thing here? <laughs> yeah. I'm, yeah. It, <laughs> Come over, so. This way? No, that way. No, that way. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I, I'm not doing this very well. <laughs> anyway, right under there is my website, suearrington.org. So that's, and I've got a, one link is contact, and that shows different ways per, people could volunteer. Um, my email address is sue Arrington at comcast.net. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So those are other ways that you can contact me and get involved. My Facebook page is very active. There's a lot of comments on it. Um, so anyway, and if I knock on your door, you can take a yard sign. <laughs> That's another thing uh, that I'm out as I'm knocking on doors. If somebody wants a yard sign, I give it to them. And, or people can call me. Uh, I don't know. Uh, we have, uh, there's a virtual neighborhood store next door. And people started asking for my yard signs on that. <laughs> so wow. that was unexpected, but. I was happy to, to deliver yard signs. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I know you had a long day. Um, just hang out for one second. Let me get this wrapped up and, and then I'll get you out of here. Thank you again, everybody, for tuning in tonight and listening to Sue Arrington. You've got her information, Sue Arrington at Comcast.net. She's on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Also, SueArrington.org if you'd like to volunteer or if you'd just like to know some more information or get to know her better. She really is a nice person. Um, so right now, you've, you've heard the information. Time is at hand. October 5th is deadline for registration. So go out there, get registered. So that way, on Election Day, you can make your voice count. Because no matter what happens in this life, remember, you were created for a purpose. So be blessed. And until next time, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Huh.